This week, we're going to take a look at the upcoming debut launch of the Vulcan Centaur rocket, which is due to take place on January 8th. And we're going to focus on one of the incredible payloads on board by talking to Charles Chafer of Celestius Memorial Space Flights. We love to hear from you. Let us know what you think of what we're doing via our social media pages at Space Things Podcast on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 175 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. Happy New Year and welcome to episode 175 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? It's kind of obvious by my voice. I have a New Year's uh, sinus infection, Oof. so my voice sounds horrible guys have probably noticed it's a about an octave lower than normal which is bad because i already have a deep voice for a woman otherwise i'm doing great Good. so other than that <laughs> yeah that's never fun we'll, we'll try and keep this brief fortunately we recorded our interview before christmas so uh, you sound lovely in the interview which is which is good I, yes and i like this husk i like this husky side of emily i think it's good yeah yeah i was watching a documentary this week about tanya tucker a country singer <laughs> yeah. and I, I love Tanya Tucker okay I think she's a badass and I kind of sound like her now which is kind of cool if I was clever I'd arrange for us to re-record the trailer of the podcast and you could do like a in a world where space and cats meet in the middle and you could do the voiceover for it because it'd be perfect right now right? that'd be funny <laughs> as hell oh my god I love I would that, that'd be funny as hell anyway let's crack on with this week's main feature Currently scheduled for January the 8th, the United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur Certification 1 flight is due to take place. Now, we spoke to ULA's VP for Vulcan Development, Mark Peller, a couple of months back to find out about the rocket. But today we want to know a little bit more about what will be on board the first launch of this impressive rocket. According to a ULA blog post, the flight will launch the first astrobotic peregrine commercial lunar lander into a highly elliptical orbit more than 220,000 miles above Earth to intercept the moon. Peregrine is slated to be the first private American spacecraft to be launched as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative to deliver science and technology experiments to the lunar surface. Peregrine is equipped with a diverse suite of scientific instruments, mementos, and other payloads from seven different countries, dozens of science teams, and hundreds of individuals. The lander also carries a two-kilogram rover called IRIS, which was built by Carnegie Mellon students to take geological images. NASA's payload suite includes a LIDAR, which is a light detection and ranging sensor, which will be used to determine the Peregrine spacecraft's exact velocity and position to land. It also has laser retroreflectors for use in determining the lander's precise location. Say that quickly five times in a row. It also has a radiation sensor to collect information about the lunar environment and spectrometers to measure resources at the landing site and the lunar exosphere. Sounds good. Of course, that's all pretty wonderful, and we hope that the lander is successful in landing on the moon and delivering some amazing science results and also mark the beginning of this new age of moon exploration for NASA and private citizens. What really interests us, though, are two payloads which are being flown on this flight by Celestius Memorial Space Flights. Now, Emily does work for this company, full disclosure there, but it was my idea to talk about this part of the flight as, to be honest, I'm fascinated by it. So one of the payloads is heading to the surface of the moon on board Peregrine, but the other is being taken into deep space once the lander has been delivered by the Vulcan Centaur. So what is a memorial space flight and what does all of this mean? We invited CEO of Celestius to join us today. We spoke to him back on episode 101 in our tribute episode to actress Nichelle Nichols. But today, Charles Chafer is joining us and is very much looking into this upcoming flight and memorial space flights in general. Now, of course, launches are unpredictable and 
There's no guarantee it's going to go up on January the 8th, but hopefully it will do. And hopefully this hasn't been the kiss of death uh, for it going up because we did record it before Christmas when it was supposed to go up on the 24th and that didn't happen. So hopefully January 8th. Greetings, Earthlings. We interrupt your regular programming to bring you an important message. It's time to crack on. All right, let's get started. So welcome back, Charles. Uh, Thank you for joining us again. So we're coming up on the United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur Cert-1 flight soon, which will carry uh, Celestis' Enterprise Deep Space and Tranquility Moonbound Memorial Space Flight. So what is your excitement level about seeing these missions finally leave the launch pad after really decades of putting them together? Just super stoked, both for us and for our patient clients. There aren't a lot of commercial deep space missions out there. So uh, I'm I'm really excited. The ULA folks have been just amazing to work with. Is this the first deep space or moonbound Celestius uh, space flight or have there been others? It's the second lunar mission and the first deep space mission. Oh, wow. The first lunar mission we conducted at NASA's request when they wanted to honor Gene Shoemaker, who was the discoverer of Comet Levy Schumacher. Anyway, they wanted to honor him. These students at Arizona State actually approached NASA and said, we'd like to do this. At the time, NASA said, well, we, we don't do these that, but we know somebody that does. Let us put you in touch with our friends in Houston. So we made... G. Shoemaker, the first person, quote unquote, buried on the moon when the prospector completed his mission and impacted on the South Pole. But this will be our first mission with the general public, 70 folks landing on the moon, including wow. Sir Arthur C. Clarke, wow. personal hero of mine. And it's the first ever deep space mission I had promised Major Barrett Roddenberry our very first launch when she attended, she asked if when when her time came, if we could fly Jean and her together on a deep space mission. And being who I am, of course, I said yes, having okay. no idea how we would do it, nothing whatsoever, but knowing that we would get there. There have been a couple of false starts on the deep space mission. Uh, we were what NASA calls the commercial infusion partner on the Sun Jammer Solar Sail mission, which was a really cool mission that got through preliminary design but didn't make it to, to flight. So this mission, after Centaur drops Peregrine at the moon, they'll refire the Centaur 5 engine, and it will go on a uh, trajectory that will take it out a hundred million miles, a little bit past the orbit of Mars, where it will become a heliocentric permanent orbiting station. We're actually renaming the mission from Enterprise to Enterprise Station oh, once nice. it gets there. We strongly believe it's the furthest human outpost in the solar system, if you will. So you can tell I'm I'm pumped. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right. (laughs) Okay, so let's talk a bit more about Tranquility Flight, uh, which will be carried by Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander. To our knowledge, uh, this is the first U.S. commercial lander, and it's also, uh, I believe it's the first uh, U.S. lander since uh, 1972's Apollo 17, which was on the moon 51 years ago. That's a while back. So. Tell us a bit about this mission and how Tranquility Flight will reach the moon's surface, uh, thus becoming the second Celestis Luna mission. Yeah, happy to. And you're right. You know, I was around 51 years ago. And at that point, we thought, well, this is cool. We're just now going to keep doing it over and over again. And, you know, Arthur Clarke called Apollo the false dawn of the space age. Mm. And his contention was that because of the Cold War, the lunar landing was accelerated about 20 years ahead of when it normally would have been. But not even Sir Arthur would say, and then we'd stop going, (laughs) which is essentially what we did. So when we designed Celestis, we had in mind all the mission sets that we now offer. And 
even then in the late 90s, there were the beginnings of people talking about doing commercial lunar missions. And so we signed on with a couple of those folks who, as all of us in the commercial space business realize, it ain't easy. They didn't make it. But finally, when CLPS was announced, the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, where they made the same sort of decision to purchase services from the private sector that they did earlier about going to the space station, space station resupply. So NASA trying to both accelerate lunar activity and get their own missions flow created this multi-billion dollar program to give contracts to companies that were likely to be able to land on the moon carrying NASA experiments. So one of the companies that won a contract, and in fact, who had journeyed down to see us in Houston right after they were founded, is a company, a really cool company in Pittsburgh called Astrobotics, connected to the Carnegie Mellon Institute. It's got heritage with Red Adair. Is that the right uh, No, Red Whitaker, Whitaker the, uh, the famous DARPA uh, scientist there. I'm sorry, Red mm-hmm. Adair put out fires in the Gulf. <laughs> you can tell I spent time in Houston. Um, anyway, Astrobotic had approached us. They won the contract, and we said, we're ready to, to sign up. We executed a commercial contract with them and then started the countdown. And Astrobotic has really, in my opinion, blossomed as a result of that, just that initial NASA contract. I think they have now two or three additional ones. They have an increasing capability to build. They have a moon museum, moonshot museum in Pittsburgh. So they built it. They integrated our capsules. Uh, I think it's actually 69 capsules, and we put one or two people in each capsule, depending upon if you want to fly with a loved one or not. And it's not just cremated remains, although that's the predominant uh, choice. We also, a few years ago, opened a service where we can fly human DNA, originally for those who do not elect cremation, but also it turns out lots of people just want to spread their DNA, (laughs) want to have a permanent (laughs) off-planet storage facility for their DNA, if you will. We have both deceased and live people who will be there with us in Florida in a few weeks watching their DNA rocket wow. to the moon. As we've mentioned, on Peregrine will be the Celestis Tranquility flight. On Centaur is the Enterprise flight with 268 folks on board, including the uh, five of the original cast of Star Trek, uh, the original series. That's the no-brainer why we named it Enterprise Flight, obviously. <laughs> uh, but there are people from all over the world and really interesting folks, two, astro- two NASA astronauts, uh, uh, a very famous Korean mountain climber who's climbed all in his life, climbed all of the peaks of the Himalayas, uh, just a broad span, and just normal folks, restaurant owners, truck drivers, you name it. So it's really, ever since we started Celestis, it was with the idea of, uh, and and no one was thinking space tourism then. It was how do we open up space to the general public? Because to me, that's always been what will drive commercial space development. NASA contracts, yeah, cool, take them. But that's not really going to drive the widespread awareness and use of the commercial space sector. So opening up space to everyone, literally, is uh, – part of what we'll be doing. Um, we're excited about it. We understand the the risks. Everybody that's flying understands the risks. Of course, the way we configure that is uh, we'll fly you again for free. We only fly a symbolic portion of ashes. So we collect more than we'll fly. And if for some reason the mission doesn't succeed, we'll tee it up and fly it again. But uh, I work for many years for uh, Mercury astronaut Deke Slayton. And Deke's statement was always, I don't worry too much about the first ones. 
because everybody's focused on it. It's just been through every test you can imagine. And those more often than not are successful. I, I worry when we get down to the 10th or 11th launch and it gets a little bit rote. So I'm holding on to that with hope uh, and an insurance policy. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, ULA is amazing. They've done 162 successes in a row with their Atlas and Delta missions. And all that heritage and all that capability is baked into bulk insert one, and which is what they call it. Can I ask a technical question? At what point do you get included within a manifest? I know weight is very precious, and I understand your capsules are very, very small, but on any launch, weight is very precious. So at what point do they say, yes, we do absolutely have space for a payload from you? This is the size it can be. How far out are you in negotiation with that? Are you a bit more of an afterthought than you would like to be is my, is kind of my question. No, not really, because, you know, just what you said, the people that fly these things worry about what am I flying? How much am I flying? What are the characteristics of what I'm flying? How do I know these guys are building something safe? That's usually at least a 90 day to six month negotiation before we can get to contract. So we're, we're about to sign contracts for our missions that are going to fly in late 2025 and wow. late 2026. So we're kind of that far out. Now those are for the big boys. When we fly suborbital out of, um, spaceport America, in New Mexico, we're on a 22 foot rocket that screams off the launch pad at, it's to Mach 6 and 2 seconds and wow, yeah. reaches space very quickly and then returns. Uh, we have kind of a continuing deal with those guys, and they, all, they always have space. There are, there are some that have mass allocations that are so tight that we don't qualify for them, but we learn that very quickly. But I think we may have flown one of the original sectors secondary payloads ever on our first flight in, in uh, 1997. That concept, particularly coming out of the space sh shuttle era where there were no secondary, there were, there were classes of payloads. But in terms of on a expendable commercial U.S. rocket, I think we may have flown the first secondary payload. Now virtually all rockets do that. And, and you can understand why. I mean, it's found money, right? In our case, yeah. we have no no requirements we have no thermal requirements we have no electrical requirements we have no comm requirements and so a lot of the providers look at us as as paying ballast meaning they're going to go have, have to go out and buy hunks of metal anyway to balance either the satellite or the vehicle and why not let these guys pay us to put their mass on the rock and when we find those people, those are the people that we um, contract with. It's so much easier today uh, than it was when we started or even five years ago. It's getting to Earth orbit now is, is just really as a commodity. It's just easy to do. Now, these deep space and lunar missions are a little bit more challenging. But as I said, with NASA, the CLIPS program, that's a multi-year program, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity there. We'll have another Voyager flight in 2026. So um, they're they're coming down the road also. Nice. Now let's get to the launch vehicle, which wait, awaits its inaugural launch. However, I, I do want to mention that ULA has a very devoted culture to pre-launch testing. There is a video of you watching the Celestis Founders flight in uh, 1997. With during that launch, uh, I, I when it takes off it, you're very stoic you're not whooping or whoo you know anything like that uh why was that and and will you feel that way during this launch or, or really any other future launches you're right it's because it was a two-stage rocket <laughs> it was that simple <laughs> this was in grand canaria the canary islands where that flight originated from on a pegasus and by the way, if you've not been to the Canary Islands, book it tomorrow. It's the coolest spot I've ever been to on the planet. But we had a couple of family members with us, and they were cheer as, as cheering and whooping when that engine lit. 
And lighting an engine is one thing, completing the burn, separating the payload and doing a second successful one is when you achieve orbit. And I try to reserve my big celebrations for when we actually accomplish the goal. If you watch any of our other videos, you'll see I haven't been too successful at, at convincing our family members to, to hold up because the cheering and high-fiving, on and, and it's just normal. I mean, it's the coolest thing to see. And again, my perspective is we got to get there. If we don't get there, we have to go do it again. So let me cheer when, when we're there. I remember during the Ascension flight, I remember when it lifted off the pad, it was a little earlier before the live cast because I was watching the live cast on my phone. And I was like, woo! And then I was like, oh, we, got, we still got some time. So don't get too excited. So I remember that vividly because I was like, yeah. And then I was like, wait a minute. It just lifted off. Like, don't get too into this. <laughs> don't well, get it, too excited. And with this coming mission, I'm going to have to wait four or five days, really, because there's a yeah. lot of maneuvers between successful liftoff and insertion into a translunar TLI. orbit and into our deep space orbit. So yeah. there'll be... Uh, some fingernail chewing during those days, of course. Yeah. I just wanted to bring up the the fact that you've ended up on, on the first flight of this new launch vehicle. Uh, and I just think that's really cool. <laughs> and that's an exceptionally cool thing to be able to say. Emily was, was, yeah. was getting at some of the first earlier. Not only is are you on a lunar flight where you're on the first private lander, but you're also the first time this rocket's ever ever gone up. How do those conversations come about? Do you instigate them, or do, do they reach out to you and say, "Hey, look, we've got this. We know you. We know this is what you do, and uh, we we may have some space for you." Because how do you pitch going? I want to be the first payload on your awesome new rocket. Yeah, well, in it's a little bit of both. Sometimes we, well, in fact, these days there's probably not a week go by that. There's so many startups out there that see us as a logical payload that we we hear a lot of those guys. In ULA's case, I tried to get on to one of their rockets for about a decade. Wow. <laughs> Started knocking on doors. And what you do is you find people that believe in what you're doing, but it's such a sea change that ULA's been going through. And I got to say, I am so impressed. And not just because I'm a customer of his, but I'm so impressed with Tori Bruno and what he's done to the culture of ULA without sacrificing the, uh, it's got to work every time. He's brought in cost awareness. He's brought in innovation. He's brought in openness to commercial cons. He and his wife are, have their DNA on, on this mission. Wow. So 10 years knocking on the door, I'd given up on him, honestly. And then I don't remember it probably we probably have been working with him two and a half years. About two and a half years ago, I get the email, hey, are you still interested in this? So somehow it bubbled up within ULA that hey, we got this guy that wants to fly on our uh, missions and and they contacted us. And you're right, this first mission is so cool. Think about the first commercial lunar mission and the first ever commercial deep space mission on this inaugural flight. And that's so different. You know, ULA for years and years was flying military payloads. And yeah. then they kind of halfway went into trying to fly commercial commsats. But now they've opened the door. They said, we've got this very capable rocket. Let's try to sell it out. And that's just such a different corporate culture. Uh, and I, again, it's it's been amazing to watch that transition. I'm very hopeful that whatever ownership changes that might be down the road for them, that they maintain. I I, I don't know you. I think you have to maintain this attitude of anything that is safe and legal, we should fly. Absolutely. So I I also want to go back to a point you made about making sure that there's a backup plan in case the launch doesn't go so well. How does that work with the lunar element of this flight and the landing? We've seen a lot of lunar landers not be very successful in the last few years. It's hard to land on the moon. Assuming a crash landing, which obviously we hope not to, have you still technically delivered your payload? 
We have, in fact, yes. So you've had that conversation with the family that actually is just getting it down on the moon. Right. It's it's not only a conversation, it's a contractual. Right. When this happens, the mission is a success. And so, yeah, no, we all want a successful landing. Of course. But we'll be one of the few people on that mission that declare a success if, you know, if it goes the fate of the Israeli lander or whatever. Absolutely. So you've been a pioneer in commercial space flight uh, since your time, uh, you're going to kill me, 40 years ago with Space Services Inc. of America, which was chronicled in a recent Quest article. Uh, full disclosure, I wrote this article. So does your excitement regarding uh, the inaugural Vulcan Centaur Search 1 flight match how you felt when Space Services Conestoga 1 was awaiting its inaugural 1982 launch? I know it's a little different time, yeah. but or a little different circumstances. But well, and I'm a little different person too. I was 27, yeah. 28 years old then, and so the throw everybody into the pool and get drunk after party, not likely t- for me to participate <laughs> in uh, with Vulcan. But there are a lot of similarities. Conestoga One was the first privately funded rocket ever to reach outer space from a private launch site. My job, I ran the Washington office in. I had to get 12 separate government approvals to do that, including being a gun dealer, all these kinds of things. It will always be the first private funded rocket into space. Unbelievable exciting to, to build up to that. A little bit more because we had blown up one a year before, different vehicle, a, a liquid fuel vehicle called Pertron. So we were coming back for our second try for Conestoga. And as you know, we were on a privately owned island, just two islands north of Boca Chica, actually, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, It almost seemed like living a dream at the time, and I look back on it now, and it still seems that way. This one's going to be similar in some ways. Uh, So much riding on it, so many firsts worldwide attention we currently are planning on having 500 guests there so we're going to be surrounded by 500 family members we had about 200 guests on the island back then every launch is unique in so many ways but these two have a lot of parallels because there's so many new efforts uh, on this this coming launch so i just want to talk about the, your guests and I think one of the, the fascinating parts about what Celestius does is the way the families are there and treated and so on and so forth. You just mentioned that they won't, you won't be involved in any getting drunk, thrown in, in the pool, uh, after party <laughs> yeah. uh, antics. I, Don't what, hold me to that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the atmosphere like? At these kind of things because you think of something like this as a, as a funeral kind of service or a memorial service and they can be quite solemn events yeah. but then a rocket going up is anything but solemn yeah. so it's got to be a weird juxtaposition of emotions uh, for for those involved right that's a good pickup so we're dealing with people in grief we can't eliminate that grief, but they're on a passage. And in many ways, we watch literally from the first day they arrive, we do a fairly solemn memorial service the day before the launch. We take them on a tour so they can see the rocket on the pad, which there are always a lot of tears. uh, And so they're going through this But at the same time, they're building the excitement to the launch. And it really all culminates at liftoff when, and we've all seen rockets lift off, and we know it's a really cool feeling. Mm -hmm. But think about the feelings that people go through when they see mom always wanted to go to space, and I'm here to make that happen. And when that machine lights up and takes off, it, what I say is that you'll never see as much cheering and high-fiving at any other funeral or memorial service <laughs> than you do at ours. 
we just you just see that transition to joy and fulfillment right before your eyes. It's one of the coolest aspects of what we do. And it's hard to describe ahead of time. So I just sit back and watch it happen over the course of the three day event. But uh, it's amazing. And yeah, their tears shed, of course, because they've all lost someone, right? <laughs> someone near, someone they cared enough about to, to come down and witness their launch into space. But the other comforting part of it is they've met four or 500 other people like themselves. Yeah, And the bonds that are built during that three-day process, of listening to the other people's stories at the memorial service, taking a viewing opportunity tour with them, and then arriving at the launch viewing area and waiting. You know, we pipe in the, the webcast, which, as Emily said, is always a little bit off from the, no, don't watch the web, watch the launch. It'll do a sooner. Um, yeah. But there's like a one or two second delay or there's a delay from it. Yep. And they'll, they'll all go through that. And, you know, we rented a big pavilion at space view in the space view park area. And it, it's a really big rocket, you know, <laughs> it's really, Dave, I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's watching people do that grief to joy transition. That's probably the uh, best part of our job. I'm obviously putting myself in someone's position here, so I, I, I'm not someone who's gone through this process, but I can imagine it must feel like your loved one has come alive again for a brief moment uh, and you've got that wonderful feeling of giving that person what they always wanted as well, which has to be an incredible feeling for you as well as those people because you're, you're enabling in that. Well, you just get speechless which is hard for me but when <laughs> when someone comes and tells you a story that says dad didn't smile very much in his final days but when we took this to him and told him what we were going to do he lit up in the brightest smile we can remember ever seeing and knowing that in in someone's last days we've provided a smile something literally to look forward to in, you know, in a, in a sense, yeah. you know, you're going. And so this is going to be the coolest set. It, it's, it's a great feeling. I, I think it hasn't been an easy 27 year climb to where we're doing seven missions a year, but during some of those lead years, people would say, Charlie, you could do a lot of things. Well, why can't keep doing this? <laughs> and I always said, there's two reasons. One, the numbers work. If we can ever get everything to line up, the numbers work. Secondly, you feel like you're serving people in this position and giving them something that they can't get on their own. They cannot go out and procure a space flight on their own. They need us to do that. So, um, yeah, it's a good feeling. You got me all poetic and teary-eyed here. It's a great thing. So, obviously, as you said, there's a number of flights being planned. With commercialization of space really, really ramping up these days and with lots more startups, as you say, getting involved. Are you already thinking about how you're going to have to adapt your business model? Because essentially, maybe one day a full funeral into space, like a burial at sea may be possible. Is that is that something you're already thinking about? Or are you thinking that's too far ahead te in technological terms? Or No, uh, we're thinking about how we serve lunar colonies, for example. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, yes. Uh, we're thinking about how do we accomplish a Mars mission responsibly? Do we land on one of the moons or so we we're, we're out there quite a bit, uh, ball body. I've always wondered about because people have asked us, but then we come back and say, well, you know, that's 200 pounds of payload. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, at 50 to hundred grand per kilo, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars if somebody would do it, yeah. you know, I'm not sure that I know of any rocket company, even if I showed up, let's say I had $25 million, some rich guy wants his body launched into space like Spock in the Star Trek. But I'm not sure I could convince anybody to do that, uh, to take that uh, mission yet. 
And I don't really have doubts about it because people say, oh, how can you do that to space? We do it to Earth every day. <laughs> What's more financial than the solar system than Earth, right? So as long as you can do it responsibly and not have it come around, and but it's just not economically feasible for anybody to do it today. And again, I, I think I'd get, I'd, it'd feel like the early days when I got turned down by every rocket company <laughs> there was. If I if I if we went that route, yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking a lot of a lot of companies are looking at Starship and and saying, look, well, that increased huge payload that they're going to offer, and and so on and so forth. I, I I wondered whether that was something that that was being discussed now. Yes, that one we are thinking about because that would allow you know as as you know now we we launch only a few grams of the cremated remains, which in some ways is good because it gives the the family, the opportunity to, to bury some of them, to turn some of them into a reef or a diamond. But there are people that ask, can you launch my full body cremains? And that's, you know, five to seven pounds. So a starship pricing would allow us to do that. Yeah. Okay. So that's in many ways, a, a compromise. <laughs> God, I, I've laughed a few times today and I feel bad about laughing, but I, I kind of have a, a dark humor, I suppose. But uh, You can't have a funeral without F-U-N. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, well, Emily, unless you've got anything else to add, I think that's a that's a good place to end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just really excited about it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to be there, so I'll be You're there. You're going to be there. there. Yeah, I will be there. I'm really excited about seeing it. You no, know, I wish I was going to be there as well. We could have a party. Anyway, Charles, I wish you all the best. I hope it goes well, and hopefully we speak again real soon. Please leave us a review or share our podcast with your space flight loving friends. This is Space and Things Podcast. So obviously, Emily, we know you're associated with Celestius, and, and that adds an extra element for, to this whole flight for you. But I think that this is uh, such a wonderful thing and such a wonderful way to honor someone. But I'm also fascinated with the fact that this is happening on these firsts, you know, the first launch of this new rocket and the first private lunar lander. I think that's just extra special. Yeah. To be involved in that must be really cool. Yeah, I, part of the reason why I, I really uh, love Celestis and I got involved with them really in the first place, I'm not trying to sound butt kissy here, but Charles, you know, has an incredible background in commercial space flight. He was one of the people with space services in the early 80s. And space services was really the first people doing commercial launches who weren't, you know, depending on NASA. Back then, that it was basically like, man, this yeah. is crazy, you know? And they did it. They pioneered it. So really, Celestis has roots in that. And to me, that's just fascinating because there are a ton of firsts associated with that. And it's a story that I don't think is really told. Um, it's such a fun story about how these guys in Texas wearing cowboy boots just uh, pioneered commercial sp space flight. Even in the, the 90s, uh, Celestis was the first. Uh, they were the first to send a memorial space flight to the moon with Gene Shoemaker uh, on Lunar Prospector, I think it crash landed in 99. It was meant to crash land, by the way. That was part of the, the mission itself. So, um, yeah, Gene Shoemaker is on the moon because of them. You know, there's a ton of luminaries who also made it to space uh, because of Celestis. The first flight flew uh, Kraft Ericke and it flew Gerard K. O'Neill on it. Um, and, and Charles has also worked, also worked with Gerard K. O'Neill back in the day. He worked on uh, Geostar, the Geostar program with O'Neill. And obviously O'Neill is a huge figure in commercial space history and, and just space history in general. I could go on about this forever. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with this time of space flight, but it's a cool story. And I, I think it's cool that Celestis is sort of, um, I, I don't know if coming full circle, maybe making another circle with the launch of uh, Vulcan Centaur Cert 1 because that also represents, you know, exciting stuff, you know, whereas ULA is going to launch commercial private space vehicles as well, not just military stuff, not just NASA. This new rocket really opens up the heavens to a lot of different things. And I think that's, 
I think that's awesome. You know, I think, and we need as much of it as we can. You know, I know in the space community, people love to pit different companies against each other and all that stuff. We need all of it. We need all the companies. We don't just need one thing, you know? So yeah, I feel like it's all coming kind of full circle right now. I think it's really cool. Yeah, I think it's, I think the, what you're getting at is more that Celestis remains at the forefront of it all. And that is what's exciting, isn't it? It, it continues yeah. to get these first. It continues to to push the boundaries of, of what you can do. When, I imagine when Space Services launched in the 80s, there was a lot of eye rolling from other people in the industry. And I imagine, oh, yeah. imagine when Celestis started doing memorial, like, or started touting memorial f- flights, there would have been some eye rolling, and there probably still is. How can you do that? Why would you do that? You know, yeah. Oh, people were making. There were cartoons about it. I think they. I think it. Um. I think it was on SNL. I think they. I don't know if they made fun of it, but they talked about it. You know, it, there was a lot of stuff in the press about it back then, like Memorial Space Flights. You know. But this is this is the future, and this is what's going to happen. So they've paved the way for it, and I hope I hope it's a success for them. I hope this is a good mission. I hope the I, I'm really invested in this uh, new. Um, rocket from ULA because you know when we yes. spoke to Mark Peller of the last month about it, I think it's just it's a cool new thing. So I'm happy with that. It's going. I, I like the idea of a private lunar lander and the fact that there's also these personal stories involved with people being honoured and memorialised through this flight makes it even more special. And I know it's not the first flight to have done oh, yeah. that. This is the 19th and 20th mission for Celestis, but it's it's still makes it very special. And uh, it was great hearing Charles talk about it, and, and especially I enjoyed hearing him talk about the family side of it and, and that personal oh, yeah. side of it. I think it's just fascinating. So it's 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 a good thing when, when we can see the world of spaceflight opening up. And even if it's not yet quite opening up for many people who are alive, if it can open up for, for people to fulfill their dreams after life, then that's also cool. I think that's also very cool. Absolutely. So as always, you can watch the full unedited video with Charles on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And for more information on Celestius and Charles, then head over to our show notes, which you can find on spaceandthingspodcast.com or just click the link in the description of this podcast on your podcast provider. Coming at you, faster than Skylab falling down on Australia. This is the Space and Things Podcast. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in spaceflight this week? This is really cool. I'm really excited to see this. This story is by Robert Perlman from Space.com and Collect Space. And um, it's basically about Endeavor, the shuttle that is in uh, the California Science Center in Los Angeles. So Endeavor has been on display since 2012. Obviously, the shuttle program ended in 2011. Anyway, Endeavor is going off public view for a few years. Now, before you groan and say, dang it, why can't I see Endeavor for a few years? It's because the Science Center is going to take Endeavor vertical. It's going to stand it up with a pair of uh, solid rocket boosters and external tank. It's going to look like it was seen on the launch pad, which sounds freaking incredible to me. Um, Many of us, including me, really have not seen a shuttle up close made it to the uh, tank and the solids, which is really awesome. So we'll be able to see the shuttle as it was before it launched, which is, to me, amazing. Dennis Jenkins, who is... Also uh, freaking amazing. He uh, wrote the Bible, basically, of the space shuttle. It's a three-volume work. You could probably mm-hmm. get it on Amazon. It's a bit expensive, but honestly, it's worth it. But Dennis Jenkins, who is the project manager for this shuttle display, and basically the the shuttle guru, oh, cool, has said, you could be very intimate with Endeavor by being able to walk under her. I think that's the uh, previous shuttle display. But... Jenkins added, that being said, how she's going to be when we reopen in a couple of years will be fantastic. So we are trading an extremely interesting exhibit for an even more interesting exhibit. So when it's all said and done, when it's uh, vertical, I'm hoping to see it. Like I said, uh, I never got to see the launch up close on the pad vertical. I I saw it from a considerable distance. 
most of the time I saw a lot of launches from a little ways away. Um, so one day I'm, I, I hope to see that at the Science Center. I think that's incredible. Now, I think it's a nice little addition to shuttle history. I'm really looking forward to it, and I know a lot of you are. Dave? Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm so excited about this one. I have been to the Science Center a couple of times in California. It's a wonderful place. It's free entry, which is always fun. Uh, they've also got the Apollo Soyuz Command Module, Gemini 11, uh, and the Mercury capsule, which Ham flew, Ham the, the, the chimp. Um, so they've got some really cool, and they've got Ken Matterly's spacesuit out there. And it's flown uh, Apollo 16 spacesuit. And it, they've got a lot of cool stuff out there. It's a great museum. Um, but when I first went there, they had a little model of, and that was in 2014, they had a little model of what they were planning for Endeavour, standing it up right. And I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh my God. That's going to be amazing. To be able to walk around a shuttle in launch configuration, be right up close to it and see it ready to go, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be so cool. So, yeah, it's it's a bit of a shame that Endeavour has to be off display for a couple of years while they get this ready, but uh, it'll be worth it in the end, and I can't wait to, to get out there when, it, when it's all finished. It's been fun watching the development happen uh, they've been posting some interesting photos. So they've already got the solid rockets in place. And obviously they're going to build the, the room around the rocket as it stands up, which I think is really cool. You always wonder how they get these big planes or these big things inside buildings. Well, we're, we're seeing that. They're, they're sharing that with us on their social media, which is cool. But yeah, it's a cool story. Really cool story. I'm glad you brought it up. I was also going to bring it up. Oh, no. I, th- I, th- I Did I steal your... Uh, I hope I didn't steal your story. That's ah. okay. I'm so sorry. All right. It's all right. There's a few things, isn't there? So it, it's not the end of the world. There have been so many news stories over the last yeah. couple of weeks. But, you know, this is about what caught our eye at the end of the day. And we can't cover everything. So, yes, I would love to have talked about Endeavour, but you did it very well. And I got to add my two pennies worth in. So awesome. that's always good. But I, I do have other things to talk about. Firstly, I thought it was lovely to see another night launch of a Falcon Heavy rocket last yes! week. Yeah, I saw did it. Did you? Yeah, I did see it. I was uh, already sick when I saw that. So it was probably a bad idea for me to go outside because it's actually cold outside it for Florida. But I say cold, let me explain. It was probably about 60 degrees. So I'm guessing around 15 Celsius, roughly, roughly, roughly. It's not so bad. <laughs> that was a in- inside the brain uh, calculation there. Uh, from the naked eye from St. Petersburg, it was freaking beautiful. I mean, it was one of the prettiest launches I've ever seen. So that was that was amazing, though. I'm suffering for it now but it was beautiful. (laughs) I'm definitely suffering for it, but it was worth it. So yeah, it's worth the doctor's bill today. (laughs) Well, yeah, they're always beautiful to watch, even just on the webcams. So I enjoyed watching that. Uh, And this one is obviously carrying the US military top secret X-37B robotic spacecraft as well. It's a secret that everyone knows about. So secretive that there's a massive mural of it on the hangar uh, by the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center, which reminds me of the town I grew up in, which had signs all over the place for a secret nuclear bunker. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very secret, but there was because si- there was signs yeah, up for it. Yeah, there's signs for it. I'm uh, like, yeah, how is it secret? Like, how is that? How is that? Yeah. yeah, same as the X-37B, I suppose, isn't it? Anyway, it's a, it's a really, for those of you who don't know, it's a really cool mini looking space shuttle kind of thing um so it kind of links with our endeavor story there you go and it, it's up there doing something which we we're not going to know anything yeah. about so we that's can't speculate good. on it probably it's probably a bad idea to speculate what it's doing but i would love to speculate what it's doing but uh we probably shouldn't so yeah yeah i'd like to get let back in your country I would at some like point not, so I'd, i'm going to not i would like to not have people <laughs> come to my door today because I, I hate saying this as soon as we're done taping this podcast today i'm probably going to go back to bed i would like not to be awakened by people banging at my door like carting me off to you know <laughs> leavenworth so yeah yeah anyway another thing that uh caught my eye was one of SpaceX's most used first stage boosters for this Falcon 9 rocket fell over while yep. it was being brought back to shore after landing on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. 
It's known by its serial number, B1058 or 1058, I guess sounds better. Uh, the first stage had just completed its 19th flight before the wind knocked it over as it was on its way back. And this is the booster that was used to launch Bob and Doug back in 2020 on that first Crew Dragon mission. So although it's now no longer usable, I really hope that parts of this booster end up in some kind of museum because it's really is a fascinating exhibit if it, if it were to end up on display. Yeah, I, I did see that new story and I was saddened to to see that happen because it is the Bob and Doug booster. It is historic. There was that part of me that was hoping it'd be on display, you know, someday at Kennedy Space Center or something. But like you said, maybe all is not lost and they can put portions of it on display. So that would be cool. Maybe they can break it up now and... and, and put it in a few different museums yeah so lots of, it has more reach perhaps yeah i always wondered whether one of these things would fall over at some point on the way back i don't believe i've seen another story of one of them falling over what well, you, you think the sea can be quite rough it is. and these things although they've got big legs there's no way they can all stay up yeah in those seas can they i mean it's just basic physics yeah really. we've had a few rough weather days in the last month so I could definitely see how it unfortunately could happen. Yeah. So that's what's caught my eye this week. And those are the stories that have caught our eye this week. As always, full links to stories are in the show notes, which, as I said earlier, are on the website or click on the link in the description of this podcast. This podcast flies on the generosity of our members. To help out, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash space and things. That's it for this week. We've had a lovely response to our request for some new Patreon subscribers recently, so a big thank you to those of you who have joined. And also a special thanks to those of you who have pushed the idea of signing up to people online, especially Larry Puzio, who put a post in Space Hipsters offering free space books for the next five people to sign up, which I believe some people have taken him up on. So that's really cool, incredibly generous, and it really does help us out. So we've got 25 more episodes to hit our target of 100 people. And we're confident that we can do this. Uh, if you've not signed up yet and want to help us carry on making this podcast, then please consider joining by heading to patreon.com forward slash space and things. Yes. Uh, again, I'd love to give a shout out to Larry. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we really appreciate it. So that that's really wonderful. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed Husky Emily this week. <laughs> of course, thank you to all who continue to share what we do. Uh, and just for listening, it really does mean a lot. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Thank you for listening. New episodes every Thursday. This has been the Space and Things Podcast. <laughs>